Welcome to another engine building tutorial with Basket Case Garage. I'm Mike Sabo, and today we're going to be building a Yamaha blaster engine. This will apply for the years 1988 all the way through 2006. That's all of the years of manufacture for the Yamaha blaster. It's a virtually unchanged unit. Now, this is a really simple and easy engine to build. So if you're new to building, this is a great platform to learn on. It's an air-cooled two-stroke. Two strokes are very simple designs, and you can't get more simple than air-cooled. Now, just because this is a simple engine doesn't mean you can't make awesome power with it. There are guys that are pushing 50 horsepower with these little 200cc monsters, and they are absolute rippers. But out of the box, they're pretty mild. Uh, most people that have these are gonna be doing a stock build. Whether you're going mild to wild, again, most of this stuff is going to apply as far as techniques, tightening torques, and stuff like that. But just keep that in mind. If you're, if you're going with wild modifications, some of the stuff might be different. So we've got all of our stuff laid out in front of us to get started. I've got my left case half, I got my crank, my transmission. Everything that's gonna be going into the center cases is ready to go. And of of course, I've got my climber service manual, which we will be referring to throughout the video. A couple things before we get started. You want to make sure that everything is prepared and ready to go. I've already gone ahead and surfaced these case halves to make sure that we have good mating surfaces. That's going to ensure that we don't have any leaks or anything. Not everybody can uh, has access to a surfacing stone. If you can take it to a machine shop and have them do it, I highly recommend doing that or at least visually inspecting them and making sure that you don't have any big pits or, or damage to your case. You wanna make sure all that stuff is good. You also wanna put new bearings in if they are needed and you wanna replace all of your seals. Now I've gone ahead and done all of that stuff already so that we can move right in to assembling the engine. The other thing that I wanted to mention is that I am not a professional technician. I didn't go to a trade school or anything like that. Uh, all the knowledge that I've learned is over the past about, I guess 15, 20 years of working with small engines and building quads and dirt bikes. I've created a pretty good reputation for myself, but just keep that in mind. Uh, all of the stuff in this video is for reference. Remember to keep your service manual uh, on hand and just use this as reference. If something doesn't seem right or your engine isn't going together quite as easily as, as mine is, stop and reassess everything because you don't want to break something. And one more thing before we get started, if this video helps you out in any way, shape or form, or if you just enjoyed watching the video, please give it a thumbs up. That helps me out a ton. Also consider subscribing for more content like this. We've got more engine tutorials and we've got build series from beginning to end where you can watch entire machines being built, plus the showcase and you get to watch them rip and everything. If you guys stick around to the end of this video, you will get to see this engine run and get to see how it performs. All right, let's get into it. Now, if you are using a climber service manual, I will have the section that I'm referring to in the top right corner. It makes it easy for you to follow along. So we're gonna get started with the crank. We've got the left side case half right here. That is the stator side. It looks like this. And we've got a brand new crankshaft right here. This is actually an OEM rebuilt by Power Sports Nation. If you guys need to have your crankshaft rebuilt, I highly recommend any motor work by them. So if you watch this tutorial and you decide it's a little too much for them, you might want to hit up Power Sports Nation. So we're going to go through. We've got the tapered side is going to be going in. And I believe this is a sweat fit. Sweat fit is where uh, it doesn't, oh, it might not be a sweat fit. But a sweat fit is when it won't just go in by hand. You need to pull it in. And actually, I was right. It started to go in there, but you can see this gap here. We need to close that up. It's not going to go in by hand. Uh, something that you do not want to do is take a mallet or a hammer and start pounding on this side, or you don't want to take your other case half in and get long bolts and try to pull everything together. That will throw your crank out of whack. You do not want to do that. The proper way to do this is by using a crank installer. This is a Tusk. You can pick this up at Rocky Mountain ATV. All of the tools that I'm using in this video will be linked in the description below. So if you guys do need this stuff, you'll know where to find it. Now the uh, puller from Tusk, it comes from with a couple adapters. So it's, it's a pretty universal kit. It's not only gonna work on the Yamaha Blaster. Uh, and what you need to do is find the right adapter that comes with the kit. And the right one is gonna thread on to the end of your crank like so. So before we do that, we have this piece right here. That will slide on. Then we'll put our adapter in place. Make sure you thread this on um, at least until it bottoms out because, or, or you want uh, no threads. If you don't put this on far enough, you can actually damage your threads. So you wanna make sure that's real good. You can see that pulls up like that. Then we've got this piece right here. This will thread onto the adapter 
And now we're effectively attached to the end of the crank and what we're gonna do is put the other portion of this tool on and it's gonna pull the crank through without damaging the crank in any way, shape or form or throwing it out of balance. So you can see there's a little guide pin right here. And then on this portion, there's a little slot right here, a little keyway. So we're gonna line those up and then the puller will slide on like that. Now you've got these two rods. These will slide behind your tube and you wanna put it in locations, nice, uh, the most reinforced spots that you can. You don't wanna go like on a thin spot or like if you were to do it up here, it's gonna go in where this, uh, this is a sp little slot for a grommet because uh, you can actually damage the cases if you do that. You wanna make sure you've got it on some good solid points. And try to space them out pretty evenly. And then we've got a nut that's gonna slide onto our center portion. And once you get a little bit of tension on there, these rods won't slide away from you. Now you can kind of position them right there. That looks pretty good. Now I'm gonna take a one inch wrench, slide it onto our nut, and just slowly start twisting away and it's gonna pull the crank right through. Now you wanna pay attention as you're pulling this in that you've got your rod oriented towards your opening. If you got it down here, it's not gonna work. It's gonna bump up against the inside of the engine. And it's gonna jam things up. You could also uh, knock this thing out of true. So I'm gonna hold this like so. Actually, I'll do it with this hand so you can see. And I'm just gonna pull this nice and slow. And sometimes these are really tight. So you might hear creaking, stuff like that. That's all normal, you hear it? That's all normal. The only thing that you do wanna make sure is if you're getting so tight that the rods are bending, you may have an issue. You might wanna bring it back out. Now, if you're having trouble getting the crank to come through straight and it keeps getting cockeyed, it might be a good idea to set up some wooden blocks and set your engine straight up and down. That's gonna make it more likely that it'll pull the shaft really nice and straight. This is a small engine and I'm, I'm pretty handy with this stuff so I can do it on an angle like this. And uh, more importantly, I'm trying to do it so that you guys can see. So if you can find a more comfortable way than I'm doing, by all means, go ahead and do it. A lot of this stuff is kind of uncomfortable for me to do uh, when I'm trying to do it for the camera. Just pulling it in nice and slow. And we're gonna pull it until it bottoms out right up against our crank bearing. We're getting real close. And right there, I think we're there. All right, and now I'm just gonna back this off. We'll loosen off our nut. We'll take our two bars out. Slide this off. Take our adapter off. And that's that, the crank is installed on our left side case. You can roll it, make sure it moves nice, nice and freely. Feels good. Now we'll put the counterbalancer in. It's gonna go in this hole right here. You're gonna face it with the threads facing upward towards you. So this will just pop into place. Right now you don't have to worry about what orientation it's in. Just pops right into place. Now we're gonna take both parts of our transmission, mesh them together and push them in place. Before we do that, there's a little groove on the output shaft, if I can get this to focus here, and that these sharp edges can damage your seal. So what we're gonna do is take an O-ring and pop that in place, and that will make it so that when we push this through the shaft, or the seal rather, it's, it's, it won't damage the inside of the seal. Okay, so here's our transmission. If, the, if your transmission needs to be serviced, look in the service manual. They have a breakdown. They show you exactly how to rebuild these things. They can be really scary, uh, when you're looking at them, but they're actually pretty easy to work with. So we're gonna mesh these together. So they're like so. The one with the O-ring, that's your output shaft, that is gonna go through this big bearing. And then right here, that's gonna go in this little bearing right here. Um, to make sure that this is oriented correctly, they will mesh together nice and easy. And also the side with the threads is going to face upward like so. And I'm gonna try to do this so that you guys are able to see, but it's difficult. Got these meshed together and I'm just very gently pushing these through. I think we got it there. Looks like it's all the way in. You wanna make sure it's seated up against the bearing. Now we're gonna put our shift forks in place. They're all marked. If you see this, it's got a one on it, two, 
and three. It's really hard to, to mix these up. You wanna make sure that the little pins are in here. I've never seen these removed before, but believe it or not, these actually are replaceable. Uh, so it's possible. Oh yeah, they do. Look at that, they do come out. I've never seen these actually removed though. I'm gonna leave it in there, I'll wind up losing it. Uh, but just make sure that those pins are in place. So we're gonna start with our number one. And we're gonna go with the pin facing this way. So our shift drum is going to be placed right here. We want the pin to face the shift drum. So if you look in your transmission, there's gonna be little slots. You'll see there's one right here. And then if you go down lower, there's one right here. You just gotta make sure you get it in the slot. It's pretty easy to identify. So that is slot for um, fork number one. I believe that is sixth gear. Now we're gonna take number three. And number three goes up here in the top groove. Same thing, make sure that the pin is facing towards where the shift drum goes. And now we're gonna take number two, this is our middle shift uh, fork, and we're gonna slide that right in its groove like so. And again, making sure the pin is facing towards where the drum is. And we're gonna place this with the bearing facing upward, and it's gonna go right in this hole, like so. Make sure it spins freely. Now, depending what year and components are in your blaster, you may have a shift drum with a welded shift star on it. It'll look just like this one. Don't worry, the installation process is exactly the same. The only difference is if you have one like the one in my video, the shift star gets installed with a screw and it isn't welded on like the one in this picture. Now you need to line your shift forks up with the, these grooves in the drum. So the gears can move up and down like so. And what you need to do is spin your drum and then move your shift fork in until it fits into place with those grooves. So we've got the number three shaft or um, fork in place. Then we've got our shift shaft. This, we're gonna take the short one. There's two shift shafts, one and two. And you can see this one has a clip on it as well. This is the, the longer shaft. We're gonna take the short one, get a little bit of assembly lube on there and pop it through the shift fork and then into the little uh, insert for the case. Pops right in like that. That one's good to go. And now we're gonna come around to this side. You can see the two little pins. Just gotta do the same thing. Line them up with the shift drum. That one is lined up like so. And uh, this one, I don't know if you guys will be able to see it. I've got that one lined up as well. Now we're gonna take our shaft, put the clip facing upwards, lube it up, and we'll just fish this through. Line the forks up, it'll pop into the case. And that is good to go. Now we're getting ready to put the other case half on. Before you do that, roll your transmission. Make sure all of this moves nice and freely and it can shift into your, all of your gears. If this doesn't wanna roll and move freely, you might wanna inspect everything, make sure it's working well. Just make sure everything moves nice and freely. Now we're gonna be using Yamabond 6B to seal these cases. You can also use Yamabond 4 or you can use the equivalent 3-Bond. I believe it's 3-Bond 1215. It's actually the same stuff. 3-Bond actually makes Yamba Bond. They make Honda Bond, Suzuki Bond, Kawasaki Bond, all that stuff. So just make sure you have the right, the, the correct one though. You don't wanna use just some random sealant because two strokes have fuel, they have gas in the uh, crank area and the gas will actually eat away normal sealants. So make sure you have a gas resistant sealant. I'm taking a little bit of lacquer thinner and just going around the edges of the case and making sure that our, our mating surfaces are clean. Because if there's oils and stuff on it, uh, it can actually um, make it so that the Yamabond will not cure or it won't seal properly. So just make sure this is nice and clean. Lacquer thinner is really good for cleaning up oils and grease. We're gonna put sealant on both case halves and I'll show you the method that I do with this. I put it on kind of in like a uh, dabbing motion. And what that does is it gives it a little bit of a thickness and it just lays down nicer, a little bit smoother. You don't have to go crazy with it. If you put a ton of it on there, it's gonna ooze all over the place. Now, if that happens, you might be like saying like, oh crap, like if the sealant oozes into my engine, like if it goes in here and stuff, is that gonna mess stuff up? It's, it's not, it's gonna be just fine. This stuff is really soft. It'll rip away or it'll just be flopping around in there. It's not gonna damage your gears or anything. Uh, you might see some of it come out on an oil change, uh, but it won't hurt anything. You're better off putting too much than too little. You don't want it to get any leaks, uh, but just a thin layer like this, and dabbing it, and when you do it on both sides, especially if your cases are surfaced, you're not gonna have to worry about any leaks at all. Now we'll put our cylinder dowels in. We're gonna put a little bit of anti-seize on these. And we've got one that goes in the front, 
right in front of the crank and one that goes in the back behind the transmission. All right, guys, here we go. Everything is in there. Just double check and making sure I didn't forget anything because <laughs> that's exactly what would happen right now. Just take our time here. Okay to tap gently. Oh, I think we got it. <laughs> yes. I think we're good. All right, now I'm gonna flip this engine case over. Trying my best not to get RTV on anything. We will be cleaning that up later. That's not a necessary step, but it definitely makes it look a little bit more pro if we clean that up. And now I will go ahead I'm just gonna run all of my bolts in place. Now, some of these bolts, if they're different lengths, the best way to discover where they go, if you, if you didn't you know, mark it off beforehand, is just by simply making sure that they're all sticking out about the same amount. So right like that is good. But like, let's say I took this one. You can see that's sticking out way too far. And then let's try this one here. You can see that's it's too low. See, how, see where this one is? You want them all sticking out about the same amount. So right there, you can see it's about the same, and then you just kind of want to go around and make sure that they're all, they've got about that same spacing. That's a pretty good rule of thumb for pretty much any engine build I've discovered. And I'm just gonna use a hand driver to bring these into place. And we'll go in a crisscross pattern and just kind of snug them up. These do not need to be tight, so just take your time here and go easy. And make sure you don't forget on the inside here, on your stator side, you've got a bolt that goes on either side, and these will probably be Phillips heads if you're using your OEM hardware. Uh, the Phillips heads have a tendency to strip out, the heads do, and uh, then you can't tighten them down or loosen them up, so I've replaced all of them with regular bolts. Uh, I just think that's a good idea. If you don't have regular bolts, you can get a bolt kit and they come with all Allen heads. The whole kit will be there so you don't have to worry about piecing it together. It's pretty nice. I'll link one of those in the description below. And I almost forgot there is one more that goes right here. And don't worry about these empty holes. We're gonna be using them later. Now we're gonna torque all these bolts down using a torque wrench. Uh, this is a great torque wrench to buy if you're new to building. It's made by Quinn. It's a Harbor Freight one. I think they're I think it was 125 bucks, which is pretty inexpensive for a digital one. Uh, it's really adjustable and it works really well. I really like it. So we're gonna tighten these down to six foot pounds. Super, super light. You don't have to go heavy on these things. We're gonna go in a crisscross pattern and just go over them multiple times and make sure that they're all at six foot pounds. This is a, a step that I think a lot of people skip. Even experienced builders, uh, they'll start to do things by hand and you can get away with that, but it's just a really good habit to torque your stuff down. And something I do wanna mention, if you're using a stainless steel bolt kit. You wanna put anti-seize on all of your bolts before you install them. You can even do it with your regular bolts. That's just gonna make it so that uh, when it comes time to tear it down, you won't have anything that's seized. You can see I'm going in a crisscross pattern here. It's a good idea as you're doing this to just keep, uh, make sure that your crank is moving nice and free because if it binds up, you know you've got an issue and you can see this one is nice and smooth. Now once they're all tight, I like to go around the outside and just double check them. Make sure you didn't miss one. Usually I miss at least one of them. Now if you're not worried about what the outside of the engine looks like, you're good to go now. You can leave the RTV dry and then move on to the next steps. If you do wanna clean it up and make it look nice, I used to make the mistake of wiping it away and it smears all over the place and it's a pain in the ass to really clean it all off, especially on vapor blasted cases that it, with the black sealant, it just smears all over the place, looks like crap. So uh, what, what I like to do is wait at least an hour. If you can wait like two or three, it's even better or overnight would be best. Uh, letting that stuff dry 
you can go around with your fingernail and it just peels right away and it doesn't smear or anything and it turns like literally like a 45 minute job into a five minute job. So I'm gonna take a break, we'll let this dry, come back and then we'll scrape it all off and we'll move on to putting the top end on. All right, so I've let this sit for the day and the sealant is nice and dry. So we're gonna go around and just with our fingernail, scratch this away. You can see how easy that is. No problem at all. It'd be smearing all over the place if we had not let this stuff dry. I'm telling you, it is worth the wait. Just take care of this later. No fuss, no muss. This is quite satisfying. If you let this stuff dry for a couple hours, it just peels right off instead of fighting it. Just a few last things, we'll move on to the top end. We've got our drain bolt here. I've got a brand new crush washer. I'm just gonna put this in place so I don't forget because I have forgotten to put these in place. And then I put oil in the machine and it spills all over the ground. So it's the, the simple things you don't wanna forget. This gets tightened to 13 foot pounds if you're gonna torque it. But otherwise just make sure it's good and snug. It doesn't need to be super tight. And then on our clutch side, we're gonna put this collar in place. And you wanna make sure, don't forget to uh, make sure that crank seal has grease on the inner lip. And we're just gonna gently press this in place. You wanna make sure that you don't roll the lip of the seal. And we'll just press that till it bottoms out. That's good. And then we have a seal retainer. That's gonna go right here. Now you'll probably have a Phillips head. I'm upgrading it to an Allen head because the Phillips heads, I'm just not a big fan of them. They start to, the heads start to strip out. So if you can upgrade it, I recommend it. I've got a little bit of anti-seize on mine because it is stainless steel. And this will get tightened down to 12 foot pounds. You're gonna have to use your hand to kind of hold it in place because it spins. There we go. And now we've got a bearing retainer that's gonna go in place like so. You wanna check the orientation. You can't really put it the wrong way. If you put it this way, you can see it doesn't really uh, cover the bearing properly. So it goes this way and it goes like this with this little kind of cutout portion facing upward. It's going to go like that. And this is another spot where there's, uh, if you're using OEM hardware, you're going to have Phillips heads. I like to upgrade them to these Allen heads. Uh, it just, they're, they're just better, man. Uh, if you could, if you do have access to these, I would definitely upgrade them. And these you can get away with just snugging them by hand. But if you want to torque them down, we're gonna to go to six foot pounds, which is what we're gonna do. Now we'll flip our engine around. Now we no longer need this O-ring. This was just to protect our seal when we push that shaft through. Now we'll put our sprocket in place. We're gonna put it with the numbers facing outward, the raised portion facing up. Line it up with our grooves and slide that on like so. And we've got this plate, same thing. We have to line this up with the grooves and then spin it. And just like so. Then we've got two bolts. I'm gonna put a little bit of blue Loctite on these. Now you can wait until the engine's on the quad and the chain is on there, that'll hold things in place. Uh, I like to do it now because sometimes I forget later on. You can use a clutch holding, a clutch holding tool like this. Um, you can get this from Rocky Mountain ATV. These are great for holding sprockets. You don't need to go crazy tight with this, but it fits into your sprocket grooves and works like a vice grip. And that will hold your sprocket from spinning. And then these are gonna get tightened down to seven and a half foot pounds. All right, that is good to go. And we've got another oil bolt right here. Put another crush washer on there. And this will go to 13 foot pounds. And a good rule of thumb, if you guys noticed, I'm grabbing my torque wrench by the handle. It will change the torque if you grip it at different areas. So you need to be gripping at the handle. That's a mistake that I used to make and uh, you guys actually called me out for it. So just make sure you're using this properly. And the last thing we're gonna do for the center cases is we're gonna put our clutch actuation arm in place. So what we're gonna do is we have one washer. That's gonna go right here. Then we've got a spring there's a hook that's sort of got a square notch and then a J hook here. We're gonna take the square notch and it's gonna go right here in this little cutout like so. Then we'll take our clutch actuation arm. It's a good idea to put some assembly lube on this 
And uh, make sure that your seal is lubricated as well on the inner lip. And this just pushes in place. And we're gonna spin this so that it catches on our spring like that. And that's gonna, oh, that, that's the, uh, the return spring. So it, it'll push your clutch arm back. All right, center cases are complete. Now let's move into the top end. So all of our top end parts are laid out on the bench. Uh, depending on what kit you have or what brand you're using, things might be a little bit different. You might be using a Wiseco, Pro-X, OEM. Uh, there's a lot of cheap Chinese kits floating around out there, and that's actually what we're gonna be installing today. Depending on what kit you have, there may be like slight differences and little things here and there. I'm gonna try to explain and make this applicable to, so that no matter what kit you're putting on, you can use the information here. But there are a couple things that you wanna do before you go ahead with your installation, especially if you're using one of the cheap Chinese kits. Uh, any aftermarket kit, I like to do this, even OEM. Uh, one thing is that you want to surface the mating areas of the cylinder and the head. If you have access to a surfacing stone, I highly recommend that you check that your head and your cylinder surfaces are completely flat, especially if you're using one of the cheap Chinese kits. If you don't have access to one of those at home, it might be worth bringing your cylinder to a machine shop and asking if they will surface them for you. We also want to inspect the inside of our cylinder. You can see the cross hatching. That's a sign that this cylinder is in good shape. Now this is a new cylinder. You may not be using a new cylinder. So you wanna check the condition. You wanna make sure there's no gouges or scoring inside. If, that's, if that is the, the, the condition of your cylinder, you might wanna replace it or have it bored out. And then the other thing you wanna check, especially with the cheap kits, is all of those ports in there, those little windows. You wanna make sure there's no slag or debris or little bits of aluminum that are sticking out into the cylinder because uh, sometimes these kits, they have really poor craftsmanship and uh, you, you, gotta, you gotta double check their work. Make sure that you're not shooting yourself in the foot by just throwing this on there. Now we're gonna put the piston rings on the piston, but before we do that, we wanna check our ring gap. Ring gap is very easy to do. We're gonna take our piston rings and we're gonna put them in the cylinder. You might as well do it the way that it's going to be going on the piston. And if you look at the ring, there's a little marking right there. On the other side, there's no marking. Whatever side the marking is on typically faces upward. So we're just gonna press this in our cylinder with your fingers, then take your piston and we're gonna press it in nice and flat. What I like to do is use the, uh, the line around where the ring sits and just bring it down to about that line on the bottom. You can look at both sides, make sure it's nice and flat. It doesn't have to be completely perfect, but you want it to be pretty flat for the most part. And then we're gonna measure uh, the, the ring end gap. So the little gap between your ring, that needs to have the right amount of clearance. Otherwise, as that uh, ring heats up when the engine is running, it will expand and the ends of the ring will butt up against each other and they'll actually, uh, they'll start to get pressure and it'll cause damage to your cylinder. So the rule of thumb is four thousandths per inch of diameter of your bore. So your diameter is going across and it, it can be, we, we can ballpark it here. We, we're about two and a half inches so for each inch is four thousandths, so we have four thousandths, eight thousandths, and then it would be twelve thousandths if we went to three inches. So we'll cut that in half and that'll make it uh, ten thousandths. So we're looking for about ten thousandths of an inch. Got a feeler gauge right here. These are very cheap and expensive to get. And there we are, ten thousandths. And what we're gonna do is make sure that, that it fits through that end gap. And we don't want, it, there can be a small amount of drag, but you don't want much. And it looks like this is good. It's, there's just a very small amount of drag, but not enough to catch it. I think we're good to go there. Check this one out. And that one is good to go too. Perfect. Now we can put the rings in place again with the marking facing up on both rings. And if you look at your piston grooves, you'll see there's little stoppers. See that little thing right there? That's where your ring end is gonna go. The ring gap on both of them. So we will line these up. We'll do the bottom one first. I like to start them like this. Bring the top of your ring over. We're gonna try not to scratch the top of the piston, but if it happens, it's okay. It's not the end of the world. And just gently walk this on. Don't force it. You don't wanna break the ring. Uh, just go easy with it. It will go on there. Just fit it into that groove and then spin it around to where the pin is, your little stopper. 
Now, same thing with the top ring, marking on top. Both of these rings are the same on the blaster. All right, there we go. Then I like to take the piston clips and put one side in first. And you're gonna get the, the opening on this clip. You want it facing downwards or upwards. Either or, or, that's a rule of thumb with any piston clip, press it in place with our fingers. Sometimes you really can't do this. These Chinese ones and uh, some other brands, the clips are really easy to get in. And uh, I've never actually had one come out, these soft ones. Um, but some companies have really, really strong clips and they're a little bit more difficult to get in place. I'm gonna use a flathead, see if we can get it to clip in there. I'm gonna make sure it's in the groove. There it goes. All right, just double check it. Make sure it's all the way in there. You don't want these things popping out when the engine's running. That could cause some major problems. Okay, now we're gonna put our wrist pin in place. We've got two different wrist pins here. This one here is a name brand. Uh, it feels a lot better than this one does. This is the Chinese one, um, but we're gonna run it because this is we're doing a little bit of R&D with this engine. It doesn't matter. Either one is going to be installed the same way. However, notoriously on the Chinese kits, the wrist pin is a weak point. So if you have a couple extra bucks to spend, it's definitely worth it getting a name brand wrist pin bearing. All right, I'm gonna take some Beanol, whatever kind of two stroke oil you're planning to use in your bike. You wanna put a good amount of oil on the wrist pin bearing. Oop. And then we'll put this in here. Now we'll take our wrist pin and we're gonna lubricate this as well. Take our piston and go to the half that we didn't put the clip in and you can get the pin started We'll go about halfway, not halfway, but just like that. Now look at the top of your piston and there's an arrow. The arrow means that's where the exhaust will be. So this will face forward. Just make sure some, uh, some pistons will have like a dot. There's usually some sort of indication of the front of the piston. If there is no marking on the top, the windows always face the, the, the back. So the intake side, these are intake ports in the piston. You can see this side is nice and smooth. So again, if there's no marks on the top, put the, the, the two windows facing backwards towards your reeds and your intake. All right, then we'll put our piston in place. Just get it to line up with the pin. Push it through. Now we're gonna put the clip in on this side. It's a good idea to take a rag and stuff the area underneath your piston because if you don't do that and you drop the clip It'll go down in your crank, and uh, that could cause some serious problems where you, you might actually have to split the cases to get the damn thing out. You don't want that to happen. So stuff it, and um, we're going to do the same thing. Put this clip in. Sometimes this side is a little bit more difficult, so be patient. And again, you want the opening towards the top or the bottom. And it's a good idea to wear safety glasses when you do this because I've had these things fly out and damn near take my eye out. So <laughs> be careful, man. Now I'll just double check this, make sure it's completely seated in that groove. Everything looks good with this one. Now on these two studs, we've got cylinder dowels to put in place. I always recommend using new cylinder dowels. They're like $2 a pop, unless your old ones came out and they're in phenomenal condition. Because you know when these things get jimmied up and you reuse them and stuff, they become really difficult to put in and out. And sometimes they don't seat all the ways. It's just, it's just a good idea to replace them, put new ones in there. So that's just my advice, <laughs> uh, but you can do what you want. And we've got one more in the front, both of these. I'm putting anti-seize on. Now I'll put our base gasket in place. Your gasket may look different than this one. This is from the cheap Chinese kit. Uh, it's kind of got like a, a shiny silver finish to it. Uh, you may have a blue gasket, a green gasket. It may have print on it. Um, depending on the brand, but uh, regardless, I will grease the gasket, and this is gonna help with, it gives it a sealing effect, and then also when it comes time to tear it down, it will help the gasket not stick to the surfaces. And then we'll match the gasket up to our ports. You can see the, the flat spots go in the back. Slide this over the piston, and around our dowels. There we go. All right, now we're getting ready to put our cylinder on. You wanna make sure that your piston rings are still aligned and then take whatever kind of two-stroke oil you're gonna use and just rub it around the outside 
of your piston. Make sure you get down by the skirts. We're gonna do the same thing with the cylinder walls. Just put a little bit of oil in there and rub it around with your finger and try to get all of the surfaces in there. And this is just so that on the first startup, uh, your cylinder walls aren't dry. All right, now using your fingers, we'll compress the rings and then just slowly work the cylinder over the piston. Don't force it. If your rings are getting stuck, just, just slowly work it in there. Once you get the rings in, you can come up and usually slide right in place. I'm going to gently tap this over our cylinder dowels. Barely tapping this. It looks like we're bottomed out. Now we've got four base nuts to put in place. And since these are notorious for backing off, I'm gonna put just a little bit of blue Loctite in here. Now on the back corner on your stator side, you have a cable stay for your clutch. That's gonna go on like so. You can see there's a little stay right there. It's positioned like that. And then we'll put your cylinder nut on top of that. And first I'm just gonna snug these by hand and go diagonally here. Now before you move any further, it's a good idea to roll your piston. Make sure everything moves nice and smoothly. You don't feel anything binding up, nothing's catching. That feels pretty good. Now to be straight with you guys, I don't typically torque the base nuts on cylinders. I've got a really good feel for it and I don't think I've ever had an issue with one backing off. But because this is a tutorial and also because the blaster is notorious for having these back off, we're gonna go ahead and torque them. Uh, it can be really difficult or impossible to get your torque wrench in tight spaces like this. So they do make a tool. Mine's made by Motion Pro and this is going to enable us to get in there and use our torque wrench. So this is our tool here. Here's our 12 millimeter wrench. It's gonna fit in the tool like that. It's adjustable, it'll fit uh, pretty much any wrench that you need. And we're gonna go ahead and snug down these jam nuts. This is a great tool to have. If you use a torque wrench, you will use this again. I highly recommend investing in one of these. I used to not have one and I would just wing it on bolts that I couldn't get to. Now I use this thing all the time. So there you go, now you've got your 90 degree bend and then this pops onto the end of your wrench like so, and you wanna keep that at 90 degrees. If you go at any other angle, it's gonna change the torque. So if you come down here, it's changing the length of the wrench, especially if you go straight out, you're changing the, your, your torque. So if you keep it at a 90 degree angle, you'll be safe. Now this can be kind of cumbersome because we're not working with an engine stand and you know tightening down these bolts, once the, we start getting into the higher torques, the engine wants to move. So you can either wait to tighten these bolts down until it's in your frame, so, you know, the quad is actually holding the frame or the engine for you. You can have a buddy come out and hold the engine. That works as well. Or my favorite method is, I call it the swing arm bolt method. So this isn't the swing arm bolt method, although you could use that, uh, but a long extension that fits where your swing arm goes, and that'll give you leverage to hold the engine from spinning. And we'll adjust our wrench. I'm setting this to 20 foot pounds. The manual calls for 18, but again, because this is a spot that notoriously comes loose. We'll go to 20 and unfortunately you lose your ratcheting mechanism when you do this because that would change the torque angle. So you have to keep it fixed as you're doing it. All right, that one's good. Then we'll come across to the one on the opposite side. Next, we're gonna put the cylinder head on. Now, if you've got an OEM cylinder head, this section isn't gonna to apply to you. You can skip ahead to this time. Now, if you do have a Chinese cylinder kit or an aftermarket, possibly, um, especially the Chinese ones though, I've got two Chinese heads here and I believe most of them are going to be this way. I've found an issue with them, but I do have a very easy fix. So I've got two fixes. Both of them require very minimal tools and are very inexpensive to, to do this fix. So let me show you how to fix it. So here's the issue. When you put your cylinder head in place, this should be pretty tight. It shouldn't be wiggling around. You see this? 
That is way too much play. And the issue is that the holes in this cylinder head, they drill them too large from the factory on these cheap Chinese top end kits. Now you probably could slap it on there and it would probably run, but it's not gonna be ideal. You really want this to be centered up and it's gonna be nearly next to impossible to do without a cylinder dowel or some sort of spacer to make this stop moving around like that. The OEM heads have tighter tolerances and they're not gonna wiggle around like that. So the first fix we're gonna do utilizes Healy coils. These are really cheap. You can order like 20 of these on Amazon for five, six bucks shipped to your front door. Uh, this is an M10 by 1.25 or M8 by 1.25. I will have this listed, listed in the description below. So I'm just gonna put the gasket on, in place to show you how this works. So the gasket is on there and then you take these and these will thread right on to your cylinder studs. And we're gonna do one in the front and one in the back. That way it will center it up nicely. Now there is a little tang that comes on these so you have to break that off first. Now I've already done this one and I'm gonna show you how to break off that tang. It's very, very easy to do. So I'm just gonna thread this all the way down to the bottom. Now let's break the tang off of this one real quick. We'll thread this on about 90% of the way. Take a uh, pair of needle nose pliers and just kind of twist this around and it breaks off really easily. Now this one will thread on to the other side. Just go ahead and thread this down. Now we've effectively made these two studs wider at the bottom and that should compensate for the holes that are too big in our cylinder head. Now this won't quite fit over those Healy coils. It's just a little bit too big. So these holes are 3 8 inch. You see the bit actually does fit in there, but it's, it's really snug. So what we're gonna do is take the 3 8 inch bit and we're gonna go in and out and in and out a couple times and that'll open it up just a hair. That'll be just enough that we should be able to fit those Healy coils in and we should have a nice snug fit. We're gonna do this on the bench. You don't need a drill press or anything like that. I understand that a lot of you guys don't have access to tools like that. So yes, setting this up in a jig on the drill press would probably be the best way to do it, but you know what I mean? Sometimes you just gotta get the job done. So let's go ahead, make sure our finger's not in the way <laughs> and uh, just bore this out a little bit. All right, that should be good as well. Now we're gonna take a half inch bit and just with your hand, you're gonna spin it and deburr it. And that's gonna help guide the Healy coil into that hole as well. You wanna make sure this is good and clean. Get all your metal shavings out of there. And now we should be able to slide this in place over those Healy coils. We should have a nice snug fit. Okay, so there's fix number one. You can see it's got a very small amount of play, but not nearly what it used to have. And most of these holes, all of them really look, they're nice and centered up. And then I would tighten this down to show you guys, but we'll crush that gasket and it'll be wasted. So now I'll show you method two. So my second fix utilizes the OEM Yamaha dowels. I have the part number right here. These are the dowels that are used for the cylinder base studs. So when you're ordering your, your cylinder dowels and parts for your engine build, just go ahead and order these as well. They're $2.22 a piece. So for $4.50, this is a super cheap fix. Now it'd be sweet if we could fit these in this, in this hole right off the bat, and it would effectively you know, be making these holes smaller and we'd be good to go. You just tap them into place and it'd be done, but they don't fit. So what we're gonna be doing is cutting a small slot in these and that will allow these to compress and we'll tap them in place and we should have a perfect fitment and that should take all of the play out of the cylinder head. And what's nice about that is once they're tapped in there, you never have to remove it. The cylinder head is basically good to go no matter how many times you remove it and put it back on. Now there's a bunch of ways you could get this done. We're gonna use the vise and a little cutoff wheel. Before we put this in the vise, you wanna locate, these do have a split in them. I don't know if you guys will be able to see that, but there is a small split and you wanna cut where the split is. So get this in the vise. You don't wanna crank down on these too tight because you'll ruin the dowel. They don't need to be very tight. Then we'll just come in here with the cutoff wheel and we'll cut a slot out. All right, that should do it. 
Now we should be able to tap this home. Boom, we'll get our second one in there on the opposite side. Be really gentle with these. All right, there we go. You can see the inserts in there. And now slides right in place. Same thing, very minimal amount of play. That I can live with and we are good to go. The second method is more effective and I definitely recommend that one, but I understand that not everybody has a bench vise and a cutoff wheel, so I wanted to show two different methods that both ultimately get you about the same result. Okay, let's install the cylinder head. We're gonna put our gasket in place. You can see one side says up. If it doesn't say up, the flat portion faces towards the side with the clutch, and then the arrow right here, this point, faces forwards towards the exhaust. So we'll go ahead and slide this over our studs. Get that in place. Now I've got stainless steel studs in here, so I'm gonna put a little bit of anti-seize on these. Now we'll slide the head in place. And we've got six washers. And six nuts. And these, I'm using flange nuts, but I believe the OEM nuts do not have flanges on them. I'm gonna snug these down by hand first. They're going to crisscross pattern. Doesn't have to be an exact pattern, just a random crisscross pattern, and you'll be fine. Now these head nuts get tightened down to 20 foot pounds. We're gonna do it in two passes. First we'll do 11, and then we'll bring it up to 20. Same as before, going in a random crisscross pattern. Now we'll go up to 20. And I'm gonna use a different torque wrench here. This is a click style. It's really no different than the other one. It just clicks instead of beeps. All right, now let's put our reeds in place. Your reeds may look different if you're putting in V-Force reeds, Boysen reeds, any kind of aftermarket. This is an OEM reed cage. When I look at your reed pedals, make sure there's no splits or cracks and that they're not peeling away. These ones look nice. First thing to go on is a gasket. Just like with all of our gaskets, we're gonna grease it up. A lot of people put RTV and stuff on these because they're afraid of leaks. And um, as long as everything is clean and flat, you shouldn't need to do that. And when you put RTV on these things, it just makes it a freaking pain in the ass if you have to tear it down. Reed cage goes in place facing inward. And then our intake boot will go on. This is an OEM boot. You may have a stuffer on this side. A stuffer is kind of like a rubber piece that sticks out. If you look at this one, it looks like somebody cut it off. Make sure this is nice and clean and flat. This is another spot where some people put a gasket. I don't think it hurts to put a gasket there, but the manual does not call for it. This built-in rubber gasket should seal it. So I'm gonna put a little bit of grease on that and then we'll put it in place and tighten it down. And we will be doing a leak down test, not in this video, but that is where we'll see uh, and make sure there's no leaks. It's an easy thing that you can pull off, put a little bit of RTV on there if you need to, if you have any leaks. But um, otherwise, if it's nice and smooth and flat, again, you should be good to go just putting it on there. Gonna put this grease around the rubber gasket. We'll put this in place. Got some new hardware here. And I'm putting anti-seize on all of the hardware. It's just a good habit to get into for engine bolts. And these get torqued down to six foot pounds. Now we'll spin this around and come to the exhaust side. Now it's gonna depend what you're running for exhaust. If you've got a stock exhaust, I believe the flange is built into the exhaust and it bolts right up. The, the whole head pipe bolts right to the, the cylinder head. Whereas if you've got an aftermarket like I do, I believe they come with a flange like this. And this is the stuff that came with my machine, so I'm just guessing. I didn't actually buy the exhaust system to see that it came with this, but I'm almost positive the aftermarket cost, uh, systems come with a flange that bolts on like so. So most people are gonna have an aftermarket exhaust, um, but that's what you're gonna be dealing with. You're either gonna be putting the whole thing on there, which probably then you would do it in the frame, or you'll get the flange like this. And you'll notice that I have this little loop on here. I actually welded that on there custom. 
there's little pieces that come with some kits that bolt on to your studs and they're little spring catches for your exhaust. I just welded this one on there so you don't even have to mess with that. So we'll anti our studs and put a new exhaust gasket in here. This might be a little cumbersome because we're working up, but I think we got it. There we go. Spin on two new nuts. I'm gonna tighten this to 15 foot pounds. All right, guys, let's get started on our clutch side. The first thing we're gonna put on is our primary drive gear. If you're just hopping in right now, you wanna make sure that you have this steel collar in place and you wanna make sure that your crank seal, if you just uh, put that in there, that the seal is not rolled and you wanna make sure there's grease in that, is all that also. And there's also a seal retainer that goes in place right here. So there's several keys that go on this engine. This is the biggest and longest one. And we're gonna put a little bit of RTV in here. I'm gonna use my Yamaha Bond because if this thing is anything like the Yamaha Banshee, this is a notorious spot where uh, you'll get uh, seals or um, a leak from the crank. So I'm just gonna put a little bit of RTV in our keyway. It doesn't have to be a lot. And then I'm going to place the key in our keyway. That, um, that RTV is gonna ooze out. I'm gonna do my best here to keep this clean. I'm just gonna wipe away any excess that we've got on here and kind of wipe it on the top so that it seals around our gear. This is just an extra measure. Last thing you wanna do is get your engine together and you have leaks. Next, we're gonna put our balancer gear in place. You wanna face it with the punch mark facing you. So you wanna face that towards you. We'll line up our key and slide this in place. There we go. Now we'll install the primary drive gear and you can see the one side has a recession that's gonna face outward towards you. The other side is flat. Same thing as with our balancer gear. You wanna line up that keyway and that will just slide in place like so. This is not in the manual, but I'm putting just a small amount of red Loctite on here and then we'll thread on our nut and we're gonna tighten that in a minute. Now we'll put our balancer gear in. Again, there's another key. It's a little tiny one. And that will go in our keyway. We don't have to worry about any leaks coming from this one. So we're just gonna place it in there. And then here's the balancer gear and it will face with this raised portion going inward and these rivets facing you. We'll just slide this in place. Like so. Now you'll notice on these gears, they both have punch marks. So we want them to line up. So I'm just gonna pull out the balancer gear until I can spin it. We're gonna come over here, spin our balancer drive gear. And now both those dots are lined up and that's where it needs to be. Now we've got a small locking washer. There's a small tab that's gonna go in the keyway that keeps them from spinning. And then uh, once we're all tight, we're gonna bend up these tabs. It'll lock it down. And you can see this is a used one. You can get away with reusing these uh, if you have to replace it. So put that in place. And even though we've got that locking washer, I'm putting just a dot of red Loctite on these. And a lot of people are really scared of red Loctite, but if you just put a dot, it does not, you, you, you can break it free, trust me. But it's, if you put like a, a whole shitload on there, then you, know, you might make a problem for yourself. We're gonna use our clutch and flywheel holder. Again, really cheap tool. You can get it uh, from Rocky Mountain, it's a tusk. Really cheap, they're only a, like 13 or 15 bucks. And I find myself using this thing on every single engine build. So we're gonna put it on the gears and you can go pretty tight with this. Snap that in place, just like a vice grip. And it's gonna go right against the bench like that with this flat portion. And that way you can put all of, all of your pressure, pressure with your torque wrench pressing down. You don't have to hold anything. You don't, it doesn't matter if you've got a buddy around or if you're doing it on the bench or in the frame or whatever, it makes it really, really easy. So we're gonna go to 59 foot pounds for the primary drive gear and check this out. Look how easy this is. Good to go, man. Now, unfortunately for the balancer gear, I can't fit the tool in there. And if you try to do this, it has reversed the direction of the tool. Now you could, in theory, probably get it if you just let it rest up against the cylinder, but that's a bad idea. You're gonna end up damaging the cylinder. So we'll use the old school soft nail technique for this one. So when we try to tighten this, 
The gears are gonna go this way. So we're gonna take an aluminum nail. Some people use a penny. You just wanna use something soft though because you don't want it to damage the gears. And you can see that stops it from being able to roll. I'm gonna roll my engine forward just so that that's not fighting me. We're gonna go to 40 foot pounds. There we go. And then of course, remember to remove your nail. I've actually forgotten to take these out before. <laughs> and then you gotta pull the whole damn side of the engine off and everything. And guys, don't forget to bend over your locking tab. I actually forgot. You can see the clutch is on there right now. You just put a flat head behind there. And gently tap it into place. And that's all you need. That's just gonna prevent that from backing off. All right, let's take care of our external shift mechanism. First thing we're gonna do is put our shift star in place. Now, like we talked about earlier, if you have the updated shift star that's welded in place, you won't have to worry about this step. It'll already be there. For the rest of us with a shift star that's screwed into place, just follow the steps after this. Let's roll this around so that our keyway is in an easier spot for us. There we go, now we got it facing up. Then we have our shift star. It faces with the pegs outward. We'll line up the keyway. This is going to be the smallest key. And then slide the key in place. There we go. Now you've got this tapered washer. That's gonna go in place like so. And then a flathead screw. Now you'll notice on the top of the screw, there's a little dot there. That dot indicates that this is a JIS screw. JIS stands for Japanese Industrial Standard, and it's really recommended that you use JIS screwdrivers for them. If you notice, whenever you use the, the Phillips heads on Japanese bikes, they get jimmied up really easy, easily, and it's usually because people don't use JIS screwdrivers. So get yourself a good set of JIS screwdrivers before you do any work on any Japanese bikes. I'll have them linked in the description below. This is gonna get a little bit of blue Loctite. And I'm just gonna snug this down by hand. <clears throat> That's good. All right, now I'm gonna spin our shift drum so that the, the little, this is neutral, where the little cutout is. All the other ones have points. I want that to be over here. If it doesn't wanna spin, just spin your shaft here. There we go, we'll get it right there. First we'll put our spring in. It's got this J hook at the bottom. That's gonna face downward and then this flat portion is gonna go up against the case on the inside. Now we've got our detent, it's gonna go this way. And then we've got a little shoulder bolt here. You can see the shoulder there. You wanna make sure you put a little bit of blue Loctite on this. It'll fit in here like that. Now let's make sure that the detent fits into our spring. And then you can get your bolt started. And this can be kind of cumbersome. You don't have to do it the exact way that I do it. I found that each machine kind of has its own little techniques for getting the shift detents on. Just don't force anything. And now get this spring where it's supposed to be. There we go. And you want to make sure that this detent is in the proper groove of the shift star. Like so. Now we'll finish tightening this down and also make sure that the shoulder of this bolt is in the detent and it's not hung up. I'm just gonna bring this in by hand. I'll tighten this to six foot pounds. Now you can test the function of this with a screwdriver going up against the case and just gently pressing down, making sure that it's nice and smooth. I'm gonna roll the engine into neutral for now. Now we're gonna put a shift shaft in. If you guys follow the series, uh, the old one was actually bent and I had to cut the end off to get it out. So this is a brand new pre-owned from Power Sports Nation. Those guys are awesome for pre-owned pre parts. They've always got what I need, most of the time anyways. So we're gonna put a little bit of assembly lube on here. And we're gonna slide this in place. And you'll see it'll pop out the other side over here like so. And then there's this peg right here that's gonna go in between these two springs. It should kind of click into place like that. Now we're gonna put our idler gear in place. This is very easy. We've got two snap rings. So we're gonna take some snap ring pliers and this will go right on the shaft. You don't wanna stretch these too wide, just enough to get over the shaft. And uh, this is a part, if you are making your parts order, I do recommend putting brand new ones on. Get, just get that on there. And uh, sometimes they don't wanna clip in like this one. So we'll take a flathead and there it goes. Just make sure that it's seated all the way in that groove. You do not want this to fall off. Then we'll put a washer in place. 
Now I'm gonna put some assembly lube on our shaft here. Now we'll put the idler gear in place. We're gonna put the bed, the, this beveled edge facing towards you and this raised portion faces the engine. So that's gonna go up against the washer. So we'll put that in place, get it all lubed up. I'm not sure why, but that's really satisfying. Then we're gonna take the other washer. That's gonna go right here. And then we have a second clip that is gonna go in front. And then this will be done. Same thing, just make sure that that's clipped in place. I think we're good. Now I'll put the kicker in. That's a very easy task to do, but just in case yours is disassembled, we're gonna go ahead and uh, build this together. So here is the kicker shaft, and then here's our kicker gear. You can see there is a little stay portion right there, a little catch. So this is gonna go on, and that meshes together like this. And that's about where you want it. You want it on, when you're looking at the shaft this way, you want it on the right side. And we've got a washer. Then we've got our spring. And there's a little hole right here in our shaft. And this stay right here is going to go in that. Drop some place like that. Now this could easily fall out, but that's what this is for. This plastic collar, you can see that little, that little groove there. That's gonna snap on our spring catch. So we'll slide this in place. And you'll see in the back, hopefully, that will, it should anyways, it should snap right in place. There we go. And now the spring won't come off. So our assembly is all together. This goes in really easy. We're gonna put a little bit of assembly lube in here. Our little spring catch is gonna go right here in the case. And then this is the stopper up against the case right there. So this will literally just pop in place, make sure all that stuff is lined up. And then we're gonna take our spring right here. And you can usually do these by hand. The pliers just makes it a little easier. And then it goes right in that spring stay right there. Now it was brought to my attention that the Kickstarter spring sometimes falls out of the stay, making it so that your Kickstarter won't return on its own. I actually had that issue happen with this engine and I did come up with a fix. Finding a roll pin that you can tap into your case will make for a tighter tolerance for your spring stay and keep it in place. Using this fix, I've done about 100 starts with this engine and I've had no problems at all with the spring falling out. Put the kicker on here and just test to make sure that it works. Hold your shaft in with your thumb. You can see it works just fine. It's moving that idler gear. All right, now we're gonna move into the fun part. We're gonna do our clutch basket. First thing we're gonna do is put this spring washer on. It is a concave washer. I don't know if you guys will be able to see in there, but it's the, the edges are, they're concaved. So you wanna put the concave portion towards you. So this is gonna be kinda of hard to see here. But the inside portion of the washer, you want that leading as you put this on like that. And we've got this thick spacer. This can go either way. That goes in front of the spring washer. Now I'm gonna put some assembly lube on our shaft. And next comes our clutch basket and gear. Now this is a billet basket. If you do want to install one of these and you're not sure how, I do have a video showing how I installed this exact basket. I will have that linked in the description below. This is gonna slide in place. And as we push this on, we're just gonna spin it until it lines up with everything. And then it should just pop into place. There we go. Next, we've got this grooved washer. It's got spaces for our splines. So we're gonna line that up. It fits in like so. Now we've got our inner boss. This is a brand new aftermarket. The clutch on this thing was fried, man. If you guys haven't seen the series, you should definitely go back and check it out. Now we've got that in place. Then we've got a lock washer that goes in place. Again, there is a little spot here that goes in the keyway. It's gonna go like so. Now I don't use the locking tabs on that washer. I just use it for the washer effect. I no, don't do that on any motors anymore. I just use red Loctite and these things never back off. So I encourage you to use the locking tabs on there and uh, you don't have to use the red Loctite if you do use those tabs. That's just the way that I do it. I don't really have any problems. So now we'll put our nut in place. And again, we're gonna use our clutch tool. This is an awesome tool. I find myself using it all the time. Definitely 
recommend getting one. I mean, I used to use like all different kinds of methods and for such a cheap tool, it's so easy to use. So this does not need to be tight. This is just gonna barely clip in place like so. You don't wanna crush the inner boss because that can actually happen. And again, we're gonna use the bench as our friend. And then we're gonna torque this down to 59 foot pounds. Okay, pop this off. Now before we install our clutch, it's a good idea to soak your fibers in whatever kind of clutch oil you're gonna use in your transmission. If you go on forums and stuff, you'll get people telling you, oh, you've gotta soak it for exactly an hour, or you've gotta do it overnight, or it's gotta be a freaking week soaking in the oil, or some people say, no, you wanna do it dry. There's a whole bunch of different theories. Uh, the way that I do it though is I take a paper plate, this makes it really easy for cleanup, we're gonna take the oil that we're gonna use in our crankcase, 75 weight, it's Gear Saver by Bell Ray. Uh, this is the first time running this, so I can't yet recommend it, but I know Bell Ray is a good brand. Came from Rocky Mountain ATV. You can order pretty much any oil that you want from Rocky Mountain ATV. It's a great place to go for really any fluids for your motor. So what I'm gonna do is just pour some of this oil onto our plates here. And as we load these fibers, I'm just gonna take the oil and rub it in with my fingers, make sure that it's on all of our contact surfaces. Now the configuration that I'm gonna do first is the stock configuration. If you're gonna use your cushion spring or your judder spring, whatever you wanna call it. So the first one, you're gonna put a regular fiber in. Then we're gonna put our plates in. Now the plates have a sharp edge and a rounded edge. It doesn't matter which way they go, but you wanna keep them consistent. So I'm gonna go with the sharp edge out and you'll notice that there's this little bump. So those are gonna go about 60 degrees. We're gonna turn it about 60 degrees each time. I'll show you. So then we'll slide our steel on. So that's just one fiber and one steel. And then comes our judder spring or cushion spring. That's gonna straddle the inside. And now this next plate is thinner. So you see these two plates here? You can see there's more fiber on this one than there is this one. One of these will come in your kit if you have an OEM style kit. And that goes on the same one where you have your cushion spring. So it's gonna go like that. Then you're gonna put on your next steel and we're gonna go about 60 degrees. So that's 45, right about there is 60. It doesn't have to be perfect. We'll slide that in place. Another regular fiber, another steel, we'll go 45, about 60. Regular fiber. Steel, 45, another 60. Regular fiber, 45, about 60, steel. Regular fiber, 45, sometimes these, you gotta play with these to get them to fit in place. 45, 60, steel, and then one last fiber goes on top, that clutch pack is finished. Now I'm gonna pull this back apart because I'm going to run what's called the full fiber mod. I do this on pretty much every machine that I do. That judder spring or cushion spring, that's really to give you a softer clutch feel. It's kind of like a nice smooth, it's just a good feeling clutch, it really is nice. But that thin clutch fiber, you know, it's like a chain and the weakest link is gonna go first. So that thin clutch fiber burns up quicker than all the other ones, and your clutch pack needs to be replaced sooner. So you get a nicer clutch feel, but you don't get as good a performance. So what you do is replace that half fiber with another full fiber. So basically I just order an OEM one, or if you pull a clutch pack out and it's in decent shape, you can reuse one of those. And then you've got a little bit more clutch performance. And honestly, I never really feel much of a difference at all in the clutch. We're gonna to try to make the least amount of mess as possible. And then we're gonna slide this in. We'll go fiber first, steel next. And it's gonna be the same principles as the other method that we used. The only thing is, it's just gonna be fibers and steels. We're not gonna put that half fiber in and we're also not gonna put the cushion spring in. So I'm gonna put the sharp edge facing up. We'll start with our first little arrow facing upward. Fiber, steel, 45, 60. Fiber, steel, 45, 60. Fiber, steel, 45, 60. Fiber, steel, 45, 60. 
fiber steel. 60. And this will be our last fiber. Now we've got our clutch push rod. This can go in either way. I'm gonna put some lube on it. This goes right in the hole. Then there's a little ball that's gonna go in as well. Put a little lube on there. Then we've got the other half of our push rod. We've got a threaded plate that goes on here. We're gonna thread this on like that. And that's gonna come through our pressure plate like so. And then we've got a jam nut that's gonna go in the front. And you don't have to worry about tightening that down just yet because that's how we adjust our clutch free play. Now, if you notice, there's a dot on our inner hub here. We're gonna put our pressure plate in place. And you'll see there's a dot right here as well. You want those to be lined up and then press this down, make sure it's sitting nice and flush. If you've got this in the wrong way, usually won't sit flush. See, it doesn't, doesn't wanna go up against the, the, uh, the clutch fiber. So you have to get that lined up right like that. We'll put our springs in place. These are heavy duty springs from Vito's Performance. Does not matter what kind of springs you use, it's gonna be the same procedure. We'll go ahead and put our screws in here. You can't just go ahead using any bolts on these. When I tore this down, somebody thought they could and it was all jacked up. We're just gonna put some pressure against the spring as you pull this in and just get it started. And we'll go in a diagonal pattern, kind of crisscross. And we're just gonna bring these in by hand first. You can use a driver if you have one, uh, but you wanna be really, really gentle with them and don't tighten it with the driver. You can just use the driver to bring them in if you want. Using a driver on these definitely speeds things up, but you don't always have to use power tools to get the job done. As I'm bringing these in, You'll see when I get to the bottom, we are not going to go crazy tight with these, really at all. I'm just barely tightening these. We're gonna torque them, but uh, the posts that these screw into, it's really easy to break those. So this is a spot where you really wanna be careful. These get tightened down to five foot-pounds of torque. Barely anything. This is, is literally as low as this wrench can go. And just go around and double check these. All right guys, now we're gonna adjust our clutch free play using this little Phillips head here. And basically what that is, our clutch arm over here, you can feel where the clutch engages. So when I press down, it's not engaging until way up here. So that's not right. You want this little arrow here to line up with the arrow on the case. You want that to be where it engages. So you can see we're way off and I'll show you in a second uh, what spinning this does and how we want to set it. Okay, so here's our clutch actuation arm. And again, you want to uh, push it against the spring until it grabs, which is right about there. Now I'm going to come in here, keeping pressure on the spring, I'm going to start screwing our push rod in. And you can see it's pushing back on my hand. And we're going to get that lined up about perfectly. Say right about there is good. And usually I'll go just a little bit beyond the arrow, gives you a little bit more clutch pull. Now we're gonna come back around front and we're gonna put our jam nut on here. Before I do that, I'm gonna put a, just a tiny little bit of blue Loctite on here because these are notorious for coming loose and then your clutch gets all out of whack. So uh, we wanna do this, but we also wanna keep our adjustment. So we'll put our Phillips head in here and then we will spin on our nut if we can make this happen. Now we can tighten up this jam nut. This doesn't have to be super tight, but you do want to get it good and snug. And now our clutch free play is adjusted. Now we're getting ready to put our clutch cover on. Before we do that, we have to put the oil injection system on. That's gonna be this right here. Now there's one of two ways you can do this. I'm actually not going to be using the oil injection system. A lot of people delete these. So I'm gonna show you how to install that, but we're actually going to be putting a block off system on. It's really nothing more than a plate. This is from Vito's Performance. But first let's do the, the oil injection system. So here is the oil injection block. First we have this threaded shaft. There's a small washer that goes on there. 
And this is going to go in the body of the oil pump and it's going to thread in place. And that's actually what drives the oil pump. Now we've got this collar and you can see it sizes down. We're going to put the part that gets smaller facing outward. It goes on our shaft and fits in the body like so. Now this is the old gasket, it's on there already, but you would replace that with a new gasket. And then this is going to go in the cover like so. And you have two Phillips head screws. Now we'll flip this over. Now on the back side, you would have a seal that would be in your case and around the shaft. Uh, again, I'm not actually utilizing this oil pump, so I'm not going to have it on there. Then you have an E-clip that goes in the back right on that shaft. There's a little groove. I'm just not clipping it in place. Then you have your water pump gear. That's going to go in place after we put this pin through the shaft like so. Then the water pump goes with this little raised portion facing towards the case. So it'll go on like that. Then there's another E-clip that's going to clip in front right there. It would just clip down all the way and then you're all installed. All right, so I'm taking this all off because we're going to run the block off. This block off is super easy to install. We've got a gasket. I'm going to grease it up. Put that in place. Then there's a billet plate. I don't think it matters which way it goes. That's going to go right on top. This kit comes with two brand new screws. Putting a little bit of anti-seize on them. Snug this up. And that's all that's to it. Now, if you are going to block your oil off and you're using your OEM carb, there will be a small vent hole that needs to be plugged. And uh, the Vito's kit does come with the plug. And then it also comes with two more plugs to plug off the little grommet where your oil lines would typically run out of the cases. Okay, we're almost ready to put our cover on. We're going to put two cylinder dowels in place. And I seize these up. We've got one in the front here and one in the back. All right, guys, we're going to grease up the clutch gasket. I recommend using OEM or a name brand like Kometic, or this one here is from Vito's Performance. You want to use a good gasket. Cheap gaskets are tough to work with. A lot of times they, uh, they don't line up correctly. Uh, they leak. They're more trouble than they're worth. Push this over our dowels. You guys can see our basket is dripping down here. So what I'm going to do is roll this clutch basket because all the oil has worked its way to the bottom. And hopefully we can get our cover on by the time the oil works its way back down to the bottom. Oh man, this cover looks awesome. This is freshly done by Moto Blast. It was vapor blasted. And I did want to mention this is a new seal where our kicker gear goes. And uh, you want to make sure there's grease in that also. We're just going to ease this in place. There we go. Then we'll put our bolts in place. I'm putting anti-seize on these. And just like before, put them all in and make sure that the same amount is sticking out on each one. And that's a pretty easy way to find where all your bolts originally went. I'm going to tighten a couple of these up before that oil on the clutch pack starts running. I don't want it to, to leak out. <laughs> And as you're tightening these down, you do want to go in a crisscross pattern. And these will get torqued to six foot pounds. And again, you want to go in a crisscross pattern. Next, we have the oil pump cover. This is where the little grommet for the oil lines go. So if you are running your oil lines, they will run through that grommet. You can see mine are plugged off. It's going to go right here. And this is plastic. And it's really just a vanity piece at this point. So. I'm just going to snug these down by hand. And we can't forget our billet oil plug. That does add a nice touch. Now I'll put the kicker in place. I'm going to put a little bit of anti-seize on our splines so that this thing doesn't get stuck on there. This will just slide on like so. Then this nut will go in place. I am not going to tighten this down until it's on the machine because I may take this off to install the engine. So I'll just put it on by finger. Now we can kick this thing over, just make sure everything's running nice and smooth. Feels good. Now let's move on to our stator side. I'm gonna turn the engine around. Now I've got two different stators here. This is an OEM and this is an aftermarket. They're both gonna be installed relatively the same. You can see the way the OEM looks. It's got a perfectly circular plate, whereas the aftermarket has these cutouts and it's got these elongated holes to mount it. 
the OEM is gonna pop in place. It's gonna line up with these two holes, top and bottom. And as you can see, the holes are not elongated, so this is not adjustable. So you put a little bit of blue Loctite on your bolts, tighten it down, put your grommet in place, and it's installed. The aftermarket, however, you can put this in place. And because of those elongated holes, you can actually advance or retard the timing by shifting the plate left or right. We're gonna get into that in a second because this is the plate that we're going to be installing. Some other differences you may notice on your stator, uh, we've got a four wire. This one, see, you can have four wires there. And this one is a five wire. Now, that doesn't necessarily dictate whether or not it's aftermarket or OEM, but in the early year blasters, you'll have a four wire system, I believe from 1988 to 02, they're this way. And then from 03 to 06, you've got five wires. Now, from what I understand, you can use either one of these stators on any year. You're just gonna have to configure your wires. If you've got a four wire stator, you will just tie back. There is gonna be a green and white wire on your wire harness. That one would just get tied back and uh, you basically abandon that wire and it will work. If you've got the five wire stator and you're plugging this into the four wire wire harness, I believe you will put a connector on this and then ground it to the frame. Now with that being said, we are going to install the aftermarket system. Again, with the rest, just like with the rest of this machine, this is kind of like an R&D machine and I'm testing out a lot of really cheap parts on this. Uh, typically, I do not recommend running any kind of Chinese electronics. I don't like aftermarket stators in general, but definitely these cheap Chinese ones, they're kind of hit or miss. You know, I've had the, I've run these before on other machines. You, sometimes you put them in and they run forever. They run great. I would say they're just like OEM. And the other ones, you pull them out of the box and they're dead on arrival. So, uh, and I've had ones fail on the trail too. So they're just, they're typically not the most consistent, but uh, we're going to give it a shot. This one is a call trick. I think it was like 35 bucks shipped. So that's the price you pay for cheap electronics. Anyways, you may have to shave down the sides like I did on this one. I just took some sandpaper. It took like a minute to do. And the reason I had to do that is because it didn't want to fit in place. It just had like kind of an ugly casting. It was a little messy, but once you uh, clean it up with a little bit of sandpaper, you can see it goes in here and it should shift back and forth nice and easily and fit into all of your grooves. Now I'll run my hardware in place, put a little bit of blue Loctite on there. I'm not tightening these down just yet. Leave them just a little bit loose so that you can, you can move your plate because we're gonna adjust this now. All right, so if you look in here, it's kind of faint, but you can see there's zero, five plus, 10, five minus, and 10. So by rotating this plate, you can increase the timing all the way up to, it'll go to about 11 degrees. And then if you shift it the opposite way, you're actually gonna retard the timing and uh, it'll only go to about minus four. It just doesn't allow you to move any further. I, I don't know why you would go that way. Um, but if you wanted, you could advance the timing. Now, how you measure where you're at is by aligning these hash marks with the lower portion of this little piece of case right here. Whatever hash mark is lined up with that is where we're at. So I'm gonna set this to zero because we are running this in a stock configuration. So right there, and now I'll snug this down. And then these get tightened down to six foot pounds. And take your grommet and stick that in place. You might have to work with your wires a little bit to get them stuffed in there. Don't put them in any way where they're gonna get pinched off or anything. And you also don't wanna put them in harm's way. Remember the flywheel is going to be spinning in here. So just keep that in mind when you're putting these in here. And then we've got two more grommets. One goes right here. And then another one goes up here. Now we're gonna get our flywheel in place. The first thing we're gonna do is put this little key in place, this little half moon. I'm gonna put a little bit of anti-seize on this because these little keys like to get stuck in the keyway sometimes. I'm gonna give this a couple light taps and get it seated. We're gonna line up our keyway I think we're on it. Now we've got this thick washer that goes on first, and this gets red Loctite. And then we've got our nut spins in place. And once again, we're gonna use our tusk flywheel and clutch holder with these two little pegs here. They're gonna go in these two holes here, and that's gonna hold it in place. Again, this doesn't need to be super tight. Like so. 
rest that against the bench. And we're going to tighten this to 53 foot pounds. All right, good to go. Now at this point, if you have a regular case saver, you go ahead and put that on there and then put your stator cover in place. Now you can see this stator cover is, it's been busted off. You're gonna get at those a lot of times. That's pretty common. Um, and then you've got a rubber gasket here. You clip the rubber gasket in place, put this on here. Now we are going to be installing a DRW case saver. I highly recommend DRW case savers on all of my machines. Um, if they offer it, I always run these things. Now the thing is these, they're, they're so encompassing and protective, sometimes you've gotta customize some of your other components in order to make them fit. And in this, this scenario is no different. So we actually have to cut this back portion of this case off. So uh, because a lot of people are run, uh, run these things and I do recommend them, I'm gonna go ahead and show how to do that right now. So the DRW case saver is gonna go right here. And as you can see, that's gonna collide with the case. So what's nice is you can see the case runs right along here. There's a nice seam there and you can see we've got same thing on the inside of the case. So basically we just have to trim this whole section off and it's up to you how clean you want to do it. You can make it really nice, try to make it look OEM or you can just saw it off and make it fit. Now this clutch cover isn't perfect, but I don't want to scratch this up any further. So I'm going to take a little bit of painter's tape and I'm going to put a couple layers just to help protect that a little bit. And then we'll open this up wide and we're gonna put a block of wood in here. That should be good. And I'll take my Sawzall. I'll try to keep it straight down the line and we'll clean it up afterwards. Now if you wanted, you could run it just like that with that straight line. That actually looks pretty good. I'm gonna clean this up though and round my edges and see if I can make it look a little bit more OEM. There's our cover, came out pretty nice. So we're gonna put our gasket in place. But you'll notice on the back here, there's this little about one inch section. We don't need that anymore for running the DRW. So we're just gonna clip that away using some wire snips like so. And then we'll go on the back of our cover and we're going to kind of clip it in place just go around the edges and it fits into a little channel and i'm taking just a dab of grease and rubbing it around the outside this will prevent this rubber gasket from sticking it has a sealing effect and it will also keep it in good shape and prevent it from dry rotting put this in place Thread our bolts in. And these would be Phillips heads if you're using your OEM hardware. These are all getting anti-seize. And all of these are the same length too, so these ones are easy. And this one up here gets a cable stay. And we're gonna run our stator wire under that. I'm gonna run all these in by hand and I'm gonna torque these to six foot pounds. Now we're going to install our DRW case saver. So there's an insert that goes in place. You're going to have to remove this case bolt right here, which I've already done. The insert goes in like so. It's going to rest right there. Then we'll put the case saver in place. Then we've got hardware that comes with the DRW kit. I'm going to put anti-seize on these before you put them in because they are stainless steel. And there's another one that goes down here. Just make these good and snug. And that is it, my friends. You have built yourself a blaster motor.
All right, guys, thank you for tuning in to this engine building tutorial for the Yamaha Blaster. If you're building your engine and you're having any kind of difficulties or something just isn't going together right, I encourage you to stop and take a break, double check everything. And the biggest thing is to remember to take your time. A lot of this stuff in these videos, it may seem like it's going together really easily, but you have to remember, this is what I do for a living, so I'm constantly working with this stuff. It probably won't go together quite as easy, but maybe it will, and I hope it does for you. But just remember, don't get too frustrated. Take your time and you can do it. All the products and tools in this video will be listed in the description below. And if you need to jump to a certain spot in this video, there are chapters listed below as well. Now, if you enjoyed watching this engine build, you might wanna go back and check out the series where we do the entire blaster that this engine is going into. It's an awesome series. It was in terrible condition when we first got it. And it's just really cool to see what it was and what it became. It's a really cool restoration. You guys can follow that along. If you enjoyed this video or if it helped you in any way, shape or form, please give me a thumbs up. That helps me out a ton. And consider subscribing to this YouTube channel to watch builds like this Yamaha Blaster. We've got Banshee builds, Raptor builds, all kinds of stuff like that. I appreciate everybody. I will see you in the next video. Peace out.